What's up everybody? Welcome to Tesla Fix. My name is Jan and today we are looking at a very interesting topic because Tesla announced that they are gonna do the compact car at Giga Berlin as well. So this is huge news. We're gonna talk about this with a very special guest today. So let's see who it is. Welcome to Tesla Fix. Make sure to subscribe and like this episode. So Alex Voigt is here again uh, on my channel because he's a channel favorite, of course. And if we talk about Germany, we have to talk with Alex Voigt, of course, with his uh, great uh, X account where he always puts out great content. Yeah, today we're going to talk about this big, big news that Tesla at Giga Berlin, they're going to produce the compact car. Alex, you have the mic now to, to start uh, the episode here. <laughs> So great to be back, Jan. Thanks for having me, and uh, yeah, happy to to discuss the uh, the topics around Germany and obviously Tesla and other stuff. So let's jump into it. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> yeah. So so how do you view um, the? Was it surprising for you that the compact car was announced uh, that it's going to be produced at Giga Berlin? So uh, actually, I'm not sure if we already um, assumed that or speculated around this, mm -hmm. probably, um, because yeah. I, I, I did a couple of times and I would be surprised if, if you haven't. So, uh, and I tweeted about it and I talked about it. So it's it's totally logic. I mean, it would be very strange if, if Tesla mm -hmm. wouldn't produce a 25K model in, in Europe simply because of the of the sheer size of, of Grünheide, Giga Berlin, um, the, the expansion plans and the, you know, uh, the love of Europeans for small compact cars. Yeah. I mean, uh, this is definitely not a truck uh, continent um, by definition, although Cybertruck is going to change this to a certain extent, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. But compact cars are extremely popular. A lot of people are, you know, in particular about Cybertruck again, are saying you can't drive this in Europe. Streets <laughs> are too narrow and you can't find a parking spot, which is actually all true. I mean, I can show you and you can show me places in Europe and we are not talking about one, many places where you, you're going to have set challenges, which, which is definitely the case, uh, simply because... You know, urban areas are here very different in terms of, of, of construction and buildings and, and street sizes. And we have all the bicycle lanes too. And then we have for uh, pedestrians also a lane, which is for a lot of Americans coming to Europe and not saying they usually walk on the bicycle lane, which creates a lot of anger. Um, but but back to the topic, um, you know, I wasn't surprised. I think it's it's a, it's it's logic. It makes sense, and um, it's the right thing to do. We all know that Tesla always said they want to produce the vehicles uh, close by the consumers, and uh, also the supply should come nearby, which is one of many reasons why Giga Berlin was located in Germany, and yeah. um, so therefore it, it's totally logic to to bring this uh, this model to Europe. But we have to be realistic. It will take a long time to to get this going. I expect this to be in phase two, not in phase one, which which mm -hmm. means between 500k and 1 million units produced in Giga Berlin. Uh, I, I guess that the 25k model will be included at that point in time. And right now, Giga Berlin is still in the in the ramping phase. Uh, we are around 250k. Uh, annually right now and you know it takes a while to to get to 500 i'm still hoping for the model 3 uh, just to put this in here uh, that the model 3 is gonna be uh, produced in, in berlin too because they all shipped over from from shanghai and it's great quality people are actually really impressed about the build quality of the vehicle and everything which is great but it's the same story i mean you should produce where the consumers are and there are a lot of consumers in Europe who are interested in the Model 3 and even more in the compact car. So um, we will see. Yeah, it makes absolutely sense. So um, to give a little bit context here uh, about the compact car, um, we had this information or, or this uh, news that, um, oh, no, the they didn't broke ground at Me in Mexico. Uh, what's happening there? Oh, my God. Um, it, yeah, it, did the municipality... Of of the the area where the where the um, factory should be created, did they cancel the plans or anything? There were rumors yeah. left and right, um, yeah. but uh, now it turns out that, of course, uh, Tesla didn't actually send them the plans for the 
expansion or, or for the building um, actually and f how they're going to set up the, the construction line there. And so th that was the delay. The delay was that they didn't send over those uh, documents earlier because uh, the, the municipality in Mexico there was already um, ready for, for building. They al already um, um, did a lot of stuff there at the factory site as well. But um, yeah, now it seems like it, it has a slight delay there. And that's why it makes totally sense that they use the, because Tesla is very agile, they're going to shift their plans. And now they're starting um, with the expansion in Berlin at first. And um, also Amy uh, from Twitter, um, um, she also expected that um, she um, said that also Mexico, uh, uh, um, Texas, sorry, uh, will have a will have a, a test plant at least um, because Elon Musk needs to be near this kind of uh, production ramp also that that they, they that he can adjust. How do you see that? Yeah, I I I, I think you know the. The original move to do it in Mexico makes a lot of ten sense from a from a cost perspective and just it's a new factory. So you built up a new factory with new tooling and new layout and all new everything. So therefore, if you have a new model, it makes totally sense to to implement it there. So I think this has probably been their first thought. And then there are I wouldn't call it second thoughts, but mm -hmm. but question marks around economy and demand and interest rates and affordability as such. So, mm -hmm. and I think, I'm not sure about the numbers, but I think it's b between seven and nine billion that Tesla's investing in new capacity and new development. So it's a lot of money going into it. And that's great because we are in a kind of downturn in terms mm -hmm. of consumers buying vehicles. And that's exactly the moment where you need to invest in order to come out yeah. of that phase uh, as the strongest. So that's actually one of many reasons why I'm extremely bullish on on, tech, on Tesla here. But back to the point. So they decided, as you indicated, bringing it back to Texas because it's, it's closer to the, let's say, top engineers um, at the headquarter. And um, so and now are the thoughts around bringing it also up in, in, in Giga Berlin. But again, it will probably take two years or so to, to mm. go into phase two. The second building in Berlin is going to be double size from that what we've seen here before. And already the building is, is really big. So uh, it, it will take time to bring it up. In particular, as as far as I know, Tesla is approaching the construction Giga Berlin this time differently. So mm -hmm. before they've been doing preliminary um, permits, so they more or less started construction regardless. And mm -hmm. in parallel, there was an application for a permit. So in the worst case scenario, they had to tear everything down again, which never happened. Uh, but obviously there's a risk for that. And usually you do the permit first, which takes a long time because of all the red tape in Germany. Yes. And then you, you get the permit and you start construction work. So Tesla, as far as I know, going back to the, to the, to the normal approach, which probably takes longer, and that fits well into the overall sentiment from Elon, who is uh, a little bit you know, paranoid, uh, nervous about the overall situation, how this develops. And I believe he's, I mean, I shouldn't say that because I have, don't have the details, but I think he's overly uh, pessimistic that, that came across mm -hmm. in, the, in the earnings call really negatively. A lot of people didn't like it at all because he wasn't making big promises and mm -hmm. he was very, very cautious. Um, funny thing is, you know, if you look back, people have been accusing Elon being too too bullish, too optimistic, too <laughs> yes. going to be the biggest in the world. So now you know, he's pedaling back around, yeah. and being, you know, conservative. And he's saying he's conservative because of an experience, his experience in the financial crisis in 2009. And now he's accused of being too conservative. So... <laughs> Regardless of what he's doing, it's it's wrong, um, and you know I think we 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 need to learn to to read in between the lines if it comes to Elon and not being uh, too um, you know too bound to his lips and and every word he's saying. So that's my take on it. So yeah. I think it's 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 it, it makes sense in particular. As for the 25K model, we have a lot of new technology going in there. And 
if we are honest, the point is we do not know which technology is going in there. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we assume it's going to be the unboxed process or, yeah. you know, uh, manufacturing mythology, however you want to call it, mm -hmm. which is a huge and big change for serial or mass production. Mm -hmm. um, if you work in the machinics industry, this is a totally normal thing to produce yeah. different parts of the machine in parallel and assemble it at the end of the line altogether. So it's from that perspective, not, not that new, but, but what Elon is doing is a combination of, of the two. And that's, that's actually, I believe pretty, pretty, pretty unique. The other thing is the underbody out of one, out of one uh, casting, mm -hmm. which in particular for the, uh, you know, for the compact car is more or less a must. So I expect this, this is what they are trying to accomplish there too. And, you know, and there are other things like the vault architecture and stuff that's probably going to change too to reduce costs. So with new technology, with new methodologies, with new tooling, which you need to invent too, partly at least, you 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 create a lot of risks. And to mitigate that risk, it makes sense to have this close to the chest, to the top engineers who can solve the issues. So therefore, Austin makes a lot of sense. As a German, I would say Germany makes also a lot of sense, mm. but I totally understand that they they want to get started in Austin. But, you know, knowing Tesla and Elon a little bit, we also know that he's changing on the fly. Yeah. So we'll see where this, how this turns out and how this is uh, going to happen. Um, time will tell. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I can also see that um, because Berlin needs at first, of course, to be expanded more uh, to, to have the capacity to, to actually house these uh, $25,000 um, car production line, um, the compact car. And also, like you said, uh, having this close to the chest of the, of the, of the top engineers uh, at Tesla and also near uh, Elon Musk, where he is located at more. Um, makes also a lot of sense, and especially Texas uh, being so near to Mexico, it also makes sense because I think Mexico and Germany will be a, such a huge strategic um, important factor to to have this factory on. And um, yeah, how do, how do you see that um, localization of of the production is so such an advantage because most car companies, especially in the EV market, we've seen it with Mercedes, for example, who actually threw kind of the towel into the ring. I, that's how I at least view it when they partner with Geely uh, with production of their of their EQS line as well. So yeah. because they did the test with the smart one and now they kind of uh, throw the towel into the ring for me because, uh, yeah, I, I, that's how I view it. How, how do you view it that... Um, that uh, Tesla is so so localizing the production, and everybody else uh, tries to partner with, <laughs> with China, for example, or Chinese companies. Yeah. So um, I, I'm old enough to have seen uh, different mythologies in the automotive industry decades ago, um, which probably most people don't remember even. So um, there was a time when automotive industries decided to outsource more to the mm -hmm. supplier base. And by doing that, cutting costs, they even offered teams on the production line to build their own business and offered them steady ordering. And even they could take the machinings out of the line. Imagine that. So which mm -hmm. was quite an entrepreneurial um, suggestion and, and offer, which a lot of people took with, because you had, this, you, you had the orders from the same company. You actually did the same, but on your own account. Uh, mm -hmm. So you've been an entrepreneur all of a sudden, you went out of the company and that, that has a huge crippling effect. So uh, automotive companies develop more and more into assembly lines and marketing organizations, which is what we've seen. And then there was a time where everybody said, you know, because in China and in Asia, uh, labor is so cheap and they don't have all the social, you know, costs we have here in Europe, for instance, we, we move, uh, you know, all this um, work to uh, to China and to other countries. And, and that took a couple of decades and, and they've done that. 
out of both of these approaches, uh, these companies create a lot of cost, um, you know, cutting. So cost went down, which was awesome because it could keep the prices pretty stable. Not talking about inflation influence here, just to give people an understanding mm -hmm. where the profits from these companies in the last 60 years actually came from, which mm -hmm. was more pressing suppliers to give for lower yeah. prices because in the supplier base they had in, in Germany and later in Asia, if I talk about German automakers, they've mm -hmm. been pressing the suppliers like take it or leave it. So they had other suppliers who could jump in to fulfill the gap. If one supplier wasn't willing to comply to the price reductions, so the, and they had to somehow manage their own costs here. Um, there's been a conflict of interest, obviously, in between the supplier base and the OEMs. And that's still the, out there because they need to make a profit too, right? So they need to earn their livelihood. So therefore, they've been interested to create and innovate only to a certain extent where they make a lot of money. Um, so, and now making the big jump here, we are in a new phase where someone is coming like Tesla and is saying, you know, first of all, we do exactly the opposite what you've done in the last 60, 70 years, we do everything, which before has been called totally nuts and crazy because it's associated with a lot of additional costs. So Tesla is doing more or less, I mean, they are not doing everything to be clear. There's a lot of suppliers out there, but yeah, especially been doing also, all... yeah, many, many German uh, suppliers are yeah. in there as well. A lot of technology exactly. from Bosch, a lot of technology from Siemens as well. So yeah, we have to keep the ball in the park here, but still, I know, I get what you mean. They are, have a lot adapted yeah. into their own hands. Um, and uh, yeah, but please go so, on. I didn't want to. So, so Tesla just did totally the opposite because mm -hmm. they've been forced to. It was never the plan of Elon to produce seats for vehicles. Actually, yeah. there are two other seat producers in the world. So why would you be so stupid to do such a sensitive, difficult thing on your own? And they had to because simply because the pricing and the, and the and what they've been looking for was not available and they've been not willing to adjust to the small BV mm -hmm. companies as probably not surviving anyway to yeah. produce them something that, that they need for their cars. So long story short, uh, Tesla had to uh, do a lot of vertical integration on their own and they succeeded. They almost died by doing it too, but they succeeded at the end of the day, which helped them to cut a lot of costs out of the processes because tier one, tier two, and tier three suppliers all earned good money on the way. So this is now all insourced within Tesla. Therefore, they have a lower cost basis and being the cost leader, which they underlined in the last earning call, is a massive, massive, massive advantage simply because you have a larger margin and you easily can reduce prices to overcome a situation we are in right now. So a lot of people who want to buy a car, a Tesla, just can't afford it. So therefore, Tesla is in a huge um, strong point here. But back to your point, Elon said that well, that's uh, probably 10 years ago or so. I, I remember that he said that a, a normal battery before it goes into a consumer product is turning around the globe four times. So imagine that. It's the ingredients of a battery is, are going four times around the globe before they end up in the hands of a product uh, of a consumer, which is totally nuts. If you think about it, just in terms of CO2 creation, makes no sense. And you can spin this around to almost everything that is in a car that is going a few times or one time around the globe, creating a lot of CO2 emissions and a lot of unnecessary costs. So therefore, what you're trying to do is you are trying to, you know, get a local supply base. And obviously, as Germany is a stronghold in terms of automotive for 100 years and more, it makes a lot of sense to consider Germany as a, as a place for building a factory in Europe because you have them nearby. By not having long distances um, for logistics, you're reducing risks again. And we all know what just-in-time is and all those other production methodologies. So you're trying to reduce the, um, the income and inventory. They have, I mean, the, 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 the not finished products inventories you have inbound you try to reduce the you know capital costs that are associated with that 
um, just to uh, make sure that you have less capital in the process, um, which is good for your cash flow and for your profit and for your balance sheet and for all and everything. So it makes it a lot of sense. So therefore, if people are talking about, well, you know, uh, why is Tesla not uh, starting production in, in Turkey or in the UK and mm -hmm. other places? What I do, first thing is to look what kind of supply base is out there. And, mm -hmm. and I'm not, not talking about, you know, this and I mean, I mean, talking about specific supply bases, what what Tesla is really looking for, um, and I think their decisions in the past show us uh, that they've been very sensitive to be near suppliers. China is a stronghold in automotive for a while, and mm -hmm. China's investing a lot builds us up. They are growing like crazy. Mexico always has been a stronghold in automotive for the U.S. because GM and all the others have been building factories there because it's been low-cost labor. So uh, it makes all sense. And uh, there are a few other countries that I would pick, but, but not that many. However, anyway, uh, right now we have, I think, a backlog in terms of, of construction. Uh, you know, Nevada is still... Is still still needs to expand. We, we have obviously Giga Berlin. We have Mexico, which didn't even start. And we have Austin, which, which is still in the process to ramp up. So there's, there's a lot out there. And I, I, would, I would appreciate if, if Tesla is focusing on this right now. A lot of people are asking for the next new factory to be announced. Um, well, we will see. I wouldn't be surprised if this takes a little bit longer than than people thought. And I'm not I'm not bearish on the you know capacity uh, Tesla is having because let's remember you know Berlin on 250k and they want to go to two million. So there's a lot of space mm. of uh, for expansion here, uh, and we need mm. to realize that. Absolutely, I also see that uh, Tesla focusing on the expansions now instead of just opening up new factories i think they have enough on their plate already yeah. uh, with that what they do be also um always when they introduce new vehicle categories that they uh, started now with the compact now they they go into a total different phase with the cybertruck uh, platform they've introduced actually the utility vehicle category which also would will include the van in my opinion i'm gonna be uh, looking out for that as well but yeah. i assume that it's also going to be more in the cyber design or more in the cyber production style um that they are doing right now there because it's also unprecedented how they were building this kind of truck and sure. um Absolutely. yeah and that's i i, I think that's uh, pretty interesting because then tesla can tackle the whole market because also vw for example is pretty strong in in every category because they have so many models of course This comes also, of course, with its own kind of problems with having so much uh, different categories and uh, just expanding the EV segment into those categories is kind of hard. They've seen that as well with, the, with their ID bus, for example, that didn't really took off like they intended. Um, yeah. it, it, it had some flaws with the size as well. Now they have a larger version they wanted to put out, but you can really clearly see that they are still having problems with, with that, also with their demand, of course. We've, we've also seen that. Um, th there's a reason why the, the br brand CEO of VW said, uh, yeah, the roof is on fire. Uh, so we have, to, we have to have a look out. But um, back to the compact car, I wanted to ask you, Uh, for the other viewers, maybe um, maybe you can highlight how important <laughs> the 25k car is, not just for Europe, but but we have some markets where where this demand is totally there. Um, how do you see it? I mean, the Highland, of course, this, the price is kind of now getting into a range which is pretty attractive as well for the European market. That's why I also think that the refreshed Model 3 would make totally sense to be produced in in Berlin as well, but. Of course, the compact car will be the top seller um, for the European market. But how's you? Yeah, I mean, that? you know, uh, let's face this: there, there's just a limited amount of people who can afford a car for 100k, uh, and even for 50k. You know, it's it's yes, there are a lot of people who are buying that. I, I never would have thought that I would buy a new car in my life because of freaking expensive. So I, I could afford it lately, and I bought my first new car was a Tesla ever. 
Um, but and for the U.S. people, it's probably weird to 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 hear that. But you know, two thirds of all cars that are sold in in Europe are com you know bought from commercial companies, from fleet operators, from leasing organizations who are mm -hmm. reselling them to to consumers or leasing them. So uh, and they get special pricing, by the way, just as a side note. Um, so uh, only one third is bought from consumers. So and, and this this cars are after a year or so of the two years uh, poured into the private ownership. Um, so that's much lower cost base, and a lot of people are more willing and able to pay that. And as Elon said on the call, which is totally right, a lot of people are just thinking about the monthly leasing rate in terms of car. Can I afford 150K a month, yes or no, or 200 or 300, is a, a critical decision for, for a lot of people. So therefore, the 25K car, which by the way, is probably meant actually without VAT. So I wouldn't be surprised yeah. if that, that car cost 30 plus here in Europe finally. But yeah. still, um, that, that, that would be a game changer because we all know how, the, um, how, how sensible the price is. And you know, the price elasticity is, 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 is showing this very clearly. With every thousand k you go down, the the group of consumers you can sell this to is expanding exponentially. Mm -hmm. So therefore, it makes totally sense to go in that direction for Tesla as it supports the mission, the mission to the advent of sustainable transportation. And you know the problem here is that the volume producers that we have today, which is mainly Toyota and Volkswagen Group as the top guys in the volume low cost ice um, segment, they're going to suffer the most simply because they are unable right now to produce a battery electric vehicles or partly even unwilling, but I think uh, not capable is describing it better. Um, they, they are not able to produce a car of, of 30k or 25k and make a profit. That's just, mm -hmm. I mean, they are not making a profit with the BVs they are producing right now. Uh, putting aside a few very expensive ones from Mercedes or BMW yeah. or even Audi, I don't know, Porsche probably on the on the on the on the premium segment, um, they're going to make some profit there, but not nothing comparable with the ICE business. So, yeah. what is the issue here? Um, their entire organization is depending on volume. So, if we talk about VW and you said VW brand, most people don't recognize that this includes Seat and Cupra and also Skoda. And they're all making almost no money right now. So, the analysis that I've seen is that the VW brand for VW vehicles makes a, a profit right now for all vehicles around 800K. And um, Skoda, I think, was 1000, if I'm not mistaken, or 1100. Which is almost nothing. So mm -hmm. it's 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 very very small and narrow, and this includes the BEVs they are producing and selling. So what I'm trying to say here is, um, with every thousand k, um, Tesla is going down in terms of price, and selling a vehicle still with a profit, it, it hurts them badly because the TCO is coming on top for the people who are buying them at the end of the day. So this is a a deal you almost can't deny. And knowing that in a Tesla you have a huge, you know, services and uh, and a huge package included on the baseline already, which all the other uh, automakers are not offering, you know that you you can't compete on price, you can't compete on features and functions, and all you can go do is try to go back to your brand loyalty and trying to push that which is eroding big time. Mm -hmm. So lately I've been showing a tweet where we've seen that in, in surveys, the brand loyalty from Tesla is, is way higher than from the rest of the of the brands out there in the market. So even that is eroding and going away. So and th that's creating an unbearable pressure on on the on the large automakers. And I believe the situation is much worse than people believe inside. Mm -hmm. We see it now with VW in particular. 
um, that they have really a big problem in terms of costs. So we're trying to reduce by 10 billion euros, uh, cutting costs uh, on the labor side and some other areas. But what I'm missing here is the innovation. I, I don't yeah. see the innovation. Especially that is software required. innovation. God yeah. damn it. Uh, VW is still so far behind. And I've tested also a Tesla from 2018 recently that I'm going to upload the video as well as soon. Um, and it's interesting to see that with the latest updates, it feels like a new car. It's, it's, it's astonishing how um, the effect of the, of the user experience when you have also your... Uh, your it's, it's like an iPhone. iPhone also has, an, has a great track record of um, actually updating their phones even if they're older. You could have right. like five or six iterations of iPhones that have the latest software. And the right. same thing applies to Tesla. Even if the models are still older, it was a, it was a Model S um, P100D that I've tested. And yeah, it, it, it worked totally fine. It was pretty uh, astonishing uh, what they are capable of. And also with uh, reducing complexity inside of the vehicle that the software even makes more stuff and more things happening on the screen. Some people don't like that. There is, a, of course, a learning curve to get used to that. But I would say this is the best approach you could do uh, because uh, the functions will change in the future. And you are, if you buy a Tesla, you know, for the next six years, at least for the next six years, you're going to get updates uh, when not even uh, on the long run. I mean, yeah. depending on the hardware, but yeah. So it's 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 a competition in terms of the business model. Actually, if you if you think mm -hmm. about the Toyotas and, and VW groups of this world, simply because what Tesla is doing, actually, we have. I mean, think about it. There are four, maybe five different vehicle models on the market, which is ridiculously <laughs> low compared yeah. to that. What Toyota and VW have, we talk hundreds and thousands. And uh, because you have just this very limited color options and interior options, there's not a lot you can choose from, which makes the purchasing process nice and short. But the, the, the reason why nobody is complaining is because you have actually all and everything in there. I mean, it's, it's a premium vehicle in terms of the, the interior, is, the yeah. infotainment and, and all and everything. And, and this is impossible for the existing automakers to compete against because the entire business model is based on the fact that they make the biggest margin on the options you buy on top. So you have these packages which, which mislead you each and single time, which are totally confusing. And, and this is done by, by intention. So this is not an accident. They've been doing this packaging of different options because their, their marching is going up there. And they know that no one would buy a base model because with a base model, you just um, almost can't drive. I mean, it's, it's, it's possible, but it's really hard. They're marketing that base model, but they are never selling it. So you have all these options on top. So consumers now realize that they've been pulling their leg for decades now and that, uh, that there's another option. For Tesla, this is fantastic because their approach enables them to reduce costs massively, which 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 means and 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 it remains to be and it will be in the future that they are the cost leader. And cost leadership means a lot in in a in a transformation we are in, and it's totally uh, underestimated. So what I'm trying to say here is, VW can't change to a a business model where they have four different vehicles on the market won't work. And as you said, the Cybertruck is a great utility fun vehicle, but what holds Tesla back to provide a van or other commercial vehicles uh, with stainless steel? Once they manage to produce them in masses, I believe they will. There will be problems and challenges, no doubt. But sooner or later, they will manage it. And, and what holds them back to, to create a van in, in very, you know, a van that you can use in different variations. People always mm -hmm. say it's a weakness that Tesla has just so few models. And to a certain extent, they are right, because some people just want a different exterior, they want to have stalks and this and that, which doesn't exist. So they are falling off the consumer uh, prospect list from Tesla. But at the end of the day, if you just look at the insane demand that, that we have out there, and I say it again, insane demand, um, <laughs> then there is um, 
then there, there, there is really a threat. And, and why I'm saying insane demand? Because my def definition of demand is uh, once people are able to afford it, say they will buy a Tesla. And, and this mm -hmm. group of people is extremely big. If you define demand of you know, uh, what, what people are able to buy right now, obviously there's with the challenges in terms of high uh, interest rates, also challenges for Teslas in, in terms of selling Model S and Model X, just natural. But um, if you look, for instance, other automakers, Mercedes-Benz is a good example, where I've yep. been providing a tweet um, showing that mm -hmm. they've been discounting big time. So we talk about 15, 20 and more percent per vehicle across yeah, the entire product line. Yeah, so this is this is obviously ICE vehicles, but it's also battery electric vehicles, and and this shows us that um, uh, the the issues are not only with with the with the volume market from VW. The mm -hmm. issues are also present with Mercedes Benz, and mm -hmm. I would be extremely surprised if 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 Audi and 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 BMW do not have the same issue too. There, there is a problem out here, and uh, the, the, the problem is going to be more obvious to the market with with every day that is passing by. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can clearly see that uh, the list kind of uh, is shocking how how much they are discounting now. I mean, uh, let's see it this way. It's um, it's surprising in that sense or shocking because Mercedes themselves claimed they're not going to engage in the price war. And suddenly, yeah. that's why. I mean, um, in, a, in a, a high interest rate environment, of course, uh, car companies lowering prices makes sense. But you need to have the margins, especially with the electric vehicles. Tesla has the margins. They even uh, from the earnings call, we've heard that they uh, reduced the cost of goods sold. That means the, the cost of their vehicles actually to produce uh, was lowered substantially. That's why they even have more leverage. And uh, now they can, especially with the Highland update, for example, is a great example. It has a much better build quality, but uh, much more features, but also is reduced in cost substantially. So they really overhauled uh, the system. And it's interesting to witness now that uh, even the luxury brands that relied on the luxury segment now l uh, sit here and, and uh, start to lower prices, especially Mercedes, because it's so far off their initial strategy that they wanted to do. And um, this also make, uh, pushes them into a position that is even more dangerous because Tesla, will, uh, Tesla said it in the first master plan that they're going to reduce costs of their vehicles until they are affordable and more and more affordable. And uh, that's what they're going to do, regardless of the market, regardless of what everybody else is doing, they're going to do that. And this will pressure the competition like crazy. In true, my opinion. true. I mean, what's what's often overlooked here is that Elon is the founder and yes, he's the founder and mm -hmm. uh, the one who's deciding. So you have, like with Ford in the old days, uh, a guy there who's mm -hmm. just making decisions based, based on his gut feel, which is good and bad too, right? So because he can be wrong, mm -hmm. and he has been wrong in the past. But he's mainly right, and he's trying to be less wrong too. So um, he can make decisions, and he doesn't care about the stock price and the shareholders actually. I mean, he cares about the small shareholders, I think. But at the end of the day, um, shareholder value is just coming out of that what he's trying to accomplish anyway because the other automakers are yeah. just not making the right thing. But the, but the point I would like to make here is, is something different. If you, if you reduce the prices for the new vehicles, you have a direct impact on your fleet. And a lot of the existing automakers have a huge fleet out there with leasing vehicles, car yes. sharing, and you name it. So if you reduce the prices, um, your entire balance sheet is going to get into a disorder because, you know, uh, you, you, have, you have a lower asset that you can show and that creates in terms of borrowing money a, a lot of challenges and problems 
that you don't want or have. So which is another thing, a reason why they've been really reluctant or at least trying to create the impression that they are never going to decrease pricing. And the list you've been just showing, that is one article out of many Google pages where this showed up. So everybody is trying to keep this under the carpet and they don't want to talk about it because it just creates a bad impression and mm -hmm. the narratives that Tesla has a problem and therefore reducing prices, although if you look two, two years back, the price reductions are not even that bad. And what nobody talks about is that Tesla is also increasing prices. Yeah. So um, there, there is an, there's a massive issue here. And on top of that, you've said it, um, the margins are going even lower on their side. And they had even some really, you know, favorable situations in terms of um, uh, in terms of currency exchanges over the period. So that was mm -hmm. playing into their into their books quite nicely. And this is going to change too over the time. Um, so long story short, the sit situation of 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 the legacy automakers is is getting worse, um, and they have a lot of headwinds. Um, we will see how the Asian and Chinese automakers do in Europe. Right now, they are too expensive, I believe, in, in certain parts, uh, yep. provided what, what value they, they create and drive out here. Mm -hmm. But Tesla is totally separate in terms of what they do, simply because of full self-driving and, and, mm -hmm. and all of that that is coming here, which is in a different ballpark. And people can claim as long as they want that this is not real, uh, I see the videos, I see what's happening here um, and, and listen to people who are using it every day. Yes, it's not perfect, but they are, they are moving closer and closer and, and this is going to happen for sure. And uh, today, just to make the point here, today I've been tweeting that most companies who are developing autonomous driving solutions like Cruise, Waymo, Mobileye, you name it, are not going to... Um, you know, lose because of the technology necessarily. Um, mm -hmm. They are going to lose because of their business model that doesn't scale. Uh, because if you if you do not have a solution that has a huge TAM, a huge total addressable market, mm -hmm. um, you just are unable to scale. And if you are unable to scale, you are not making enough profit. GM lost 10 billion with the cruise um, solution. Mm -hmm. and revealed that there are people, you know, in the back office who are supporting the vehicles all the time because, you know, sometimes it's needed. That is not a you know, tenable, working, sustainable business model. Um, in particular, if you only can provide the service in certain parts of the country or in certain cities, and I'm not talking here even about the technology issues they have, and that the vehicles mm -hmm. are very expensive to, to manufacture, GM has stopped producing um, their vehicles, uh, which is another indication that they are in trouble. So I think the, the, the business model and the economies of, of scale those companies have are underrated. And there's only one company who is really trying to create a solution for vehicles that drive everywhere, even on dirt mm -hmm. roads, on, on lakes where you just yep. hardly find a, a, a road point to identify yeah, a point, where a the road point yeah yeah right yeah. so even for humans this is hard and full self driving is is driving along that road uh, like a champ so uh, you know th that that's telling um not because this dirt road is so important but because this means that the solution will be able to drive everywhere and that mm -hmm. means a total addressable market is going to be everywhere and that means that the ability to create revenue and with that profit is yeah. extremely high with Tesla. So, and everybody has listened now also has heard that I haven't talked about sensors, I haven't talked about algorithms, I haven't talked about technology at all. Mm -hmm. So, and I think this is underrated. So regardless if you believe uh, if Tesla will make it or not, one thing is clear, Cruz, Waymo, Waymo and all the others just don't have a scalable solution right now. They are not yeah. even developing a scalable solution. So therefore, I don't know how they will survive. It's, yeah. I, I don't I see it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I also agree. It's it's crazy how, how Tesla is in such a pole position. Um, 
And maybe for the end of this episode, we can look at again, maybe the outlook a little bit, how you view that um, the yeah FSD. You've talked about that right now. I mean, it's uh, interesting. How do you see that? How many years could it take? Uh, should or should it take? And um, also uh, now with the twenty-five thousand uh, dollar car, the compact car, that's uh, more and more. Uh, nearer and nearer you could say probably in the next ballpark how long do you view that that all those things are happening is it two years one year or do you see it in five years or does so, it even matter <laughs> yeah it actually it's it's a letter it doesn't really matter you, you're gonna have if we talk two years from now or later we are going to have the same conversation we are going not because the yeah. solutions are not available simply because tesla is moving on so yeah. this will continue. There will be new products and new services out there and we will talk about when this will be realized. And yeah. there is not going to be the one moment when full self-driving is ready to be launched. It's going to be a transition phase. Um, in terms of technology, nobody knows how long the long tail is of issues that needs to be solved. And lately there was a good... Um, there was a good tweet Elon replied on, which I totally agree with, which which said, you know, how many less deaths you need to have as a regulator comparing full self-driving yeah. with the average driver on the road um, to come up with a conclusion that autonomous vehicles make sense. Mm. And what this is revealing is, and that's... My, my opinion totally true is that every accident and every death that happens through an auto, autonomous vehicles is, you know, uh, emphasized and, and weighted um, on a on a scale that is at least 10 times, if, if, if not 100 times, more than every death and injury and accident that happens from a human driver which is totally nuts because at yeah. the end of the day, we should value life as life, right? So mm -hmm. if we can save from 10 dead people, five, we should do it right away. But mm -hmm. I believe this is not happening because most people don't understand the technology and they are confused. And obviously there are a lot of lobby groups who are trying to divert the attention and, and mislead mm -hmm. people. So therefore a lot of people think like, this is dangerous. It isn't mm -hmm. already today. It's it's saving life. Therefore, and what I'm trying to say here, back to your question, is that the regulators are obviously a big problem. Uh, mm -hmm. That they are a problem in Europe, we know already. So that that probably will take a long time. Maybe the UK is faster, but yeah. I hope that in the US, uh, people are starting to think about it a little bit more openly. I'm also pretty more bullish on China simply because mm -hmm. it's more an autocracy and and not a democratic system. It sounds strange for me to say this as a supporter yes. of democratic systems, but at the end of the day, this uh, people are probably understanding that being a technology leader is creating a lot of value and wealth for for their country on the long run. Mm -hmm. So therefore, they are more open to to allow that particularly as they have Tesla, you know, producing already vehicles there. Um, so I'm, I'm concerned about the regulators. Um, that, that's, that's one thing. Uh, but we are going to have new products coming up. I mean, Tesla bot, it's, it's an even more crazy valuation that we will mm -hmm. see. I've been just going through the valuation model from, from Søren Bescher. Um, he was with Herbert. Friday with Herbert channel, yep. which I really recommend for everybody to listen to carefully yep. and really try to understand what he calculated because it's so nutty. It's so nutty what's coming out of there in terms of, um, you know, company value at the end of the mm -hmm. day, even if you, you calculate in a conservative way. So yep. long story short, long answer to a short question. Um, you're not going to get out of this. Um, it, it's going to continue. Uh, but like we've seen, seen in the past that the promises from Tesla has been implemented. And yes, you can say, oh, you know, full self-driving has been promoted every year since in the last five years. I don't know, yeah. which is true. Um, it doesn't matter at the end of the day. The, the only thing that matters is 
if they canceled it because they decided it's, it will never work, we will get out of here and this didn't happen and won't happen. Or if they say we, we are going to make it and moving closer to it. And, and this is what we see. So therefore, I'm, uh, I'm very excited about that. And I think it will make a huge, huge difference. Absolutely. And now combined with the, with the compact car, which is, uh, I, I view well, the cars as a platform for the software in the end of the exactly. day. And, and especially when FSD, like I've mentioned here, you brought up very good points for the end of the episode here um, that I really um, also have to think about again uh, because now the, the, the cars as a platform, like uh, Tesla having their app store, like, like the iPhone app store, and um, yeah, they're a technology company, not a car company. And uh, but, I think it will show and show more and more that, uh, for example, the Tesla bot is just a platform. The car is just a platform. It's like a like a device where you run the very very valuable Tesla software. Actually, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. I've been writing a tweet. I think the day before yesterday or the day before there, where I've been replying to AIX. So the uh, you mean XAI? New, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, XAI. And I've been when this was announced that it's now live. Uh, yeah. Grok, right? Yeah. Grok is yeah. the name of it. <laughs> Um, and I've been replying that um, Tesla, or I've been retweeting it and saying Tesla is essentially an AI company. And the funny part is that a lot of people replied, well, well, this is legally a different legal entity and, you know, uh, and this is not Tesla and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and, yeah. and people just didn't understand what I've been trying to convey. And I've been reading the comments after a few hours and I've been replying saying it's so funny that people just don't understand what Tesla really is and how they misunderstand what, what Tesla is doing here. And because Elon is the founder of all those companies who all yeah. have a certain part of AI already running in-house and algorithms, it doesn't they matter. Share, it, they it even doesn't, share workers or talents yeah. between It doesn't the matter shape if and, it's... it's yeah. So it's, yeah, it's totally yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I have to I have to add something here because um, that's also what people missed. Why do you think te uh, Elon Musk started the X Holding Company? Right, it's the mothership so, like Alphabet for Google. Yeah, and so, X but, is gonna be the, the the that's the holding point, and every company will come and come more and more together, as well as we're gonna see Starlink on the roofs of the Teslas. At some day, we're gonna see. Uh, I mean. We could go crazy how what combinations you can come up with with combining those companies, and exactly. Uh, so yeah. so you, you will have this cross solutions and services in between the companies as we have this already today, but based on my tweet, Elon replied with with yeah, um, so he just confirmed that 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 I obviously hit a point here, which is that AI is going to be the most value creator in the future. And we all remember when Elon said that Tesla as an auto business is almost worth nothing. And people yes. have been shocked about it because they've been invested and they thought, wow, now the stock price is crumbling, this company is worth nothing. But what he was trying to say is that because the value you create with artificial intelligence and the software is so crazy, that the value you create with the auto business is at the end just the icing on the cake here a little bit in addition on top of that. It doesn't make yeah. a big difference. The big <laughs> difference is coming from the big business and the big business is software and artificial intelligence, which most people just don't understand because artificial intelligence is for them something very fuzzy. They can't really comprehend what it means and how yeah. you ever can make money with that. Um, but mm -hmm. people who are a little bit deeper in the industry, they understand that this is a holy grail. And um, as you said correctly, with um, the development of Tesla, the opportunities to, to use artificial intelligence in different parts of the business is increasing exponentially. So Tesla has way more options to make money in the future than anybody yeah. else who doesn't have a supercomputer like Dojo. So um, it's um, it's crazy what's happening here, and I'm still stunned uh, how few people understand this. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, Alex, thank you very much for being on. I mean, uh, it was such an interesting discussion, I think. And, uh, of course, uh, to everybody, if you have a 
question that's burning uh, inside of your head now. Ah, I have to get it out there. Please write it down below if you uh, thought of something, as well as how do you view the the topic uh, to the now to the uh, of course to the listeners and viewers again. Uh, how do you view the developments of Tesla? Do you think they're on a good track? Do you think that w what should they do? Is the compact car coming to Berlin? Uh, it was it would totally interest me to if you wrote, wrote that down. So please everybody follow also Alex Voigt on X. I'm gonna link everything down below as always and on top of the right corner here in the video. So yeah, Alex, thank you very much for being on. And um, yeah. yeah, I think there's only one last thing to say, and that's uh, of course goodbye everybody. Wasn't this episode awesome? Let's accelerate the pace of innovation by subscribing to Tesla Fix. It is my absolute favorite channel on the whole interwebs.